let's talk about some rising players in Dynasty, specifically players that, according to the consensus, Fantasy Calc, Keep Trade Cut, are just not rising as quickly or as drastically as they should be up the rankings. These are guys that you should be targeting in trades before the masses catch up and they truly explode. And if you have one of these guys on your team, do not let anyone fool you into selling low. My name is Paul, this is Pure Potential. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment, let's get into it. So the idea today is identifying players that the market has been too slow to adjust on. A lot of dynasty managers fall prey to something called anchoring bias, which is defined as people's tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information that they receive. And regardless of the accuracy of that information, people tend to use it as a reference or anchor to make subsequent judgments. A very common example of anchoring bias is when you get that urge to buy something that's on sale, even if that thing was overpriced to begin with. Our mind anchors to that original price, and so seeing the sale price, we trick ourselves into thinking it's an incredible deal even when it isn't. And it can be very difficult to avoid this bias in Dynasty. I struggle all the time to accurately evaluate players based on the current information that we have rather than outdated assumptions. But it's something we have to constantly fight against because underreacting to new information in Dynasty can be just as damaging to your teams as overreacting. So let's get into these five players. But first, if you want to know what I think about any player at any time, Consider hitting that join button underneath the video or on my channel page and becoming a YouTube member. That's gonna get you access to my top 200 dynasty rankings, which I update weekly, members only live streams right here on YouTube, and the members chat on Discord, where I am constantly interacting with members, providing player takes and weighing in on potential dynasty trades. Now with that out of the way, let's start with Josh Downs here, who had a pretty underrated rookie season. I highlighted him this summer as a potential breakout candidate, and that is really coming to fruition here. But in his rookie year, first eight games, 0.23 targets per outrun, 2.0 yards per outrun. Very, very good. He was actually performing pretty comparably to Michael Pittman right away as a rookie. Up until week nine, when he suffered a knee sprain, he played just 20% of the snaps in back-to-back -back games, and his numbers dipped the rest of the season. Now this year, we're pretty much getting the full-on breakout. A couple of rough games from Anthony Richardson have suppressed the fantasy point totals a little bit, but we're still looking at 0.32 targets per out run. That's fifth best among all wide receivers. 2.4 yards per out run. That's 16th. 33.1% first read percentage, that's 11th, and 0.129 first downs per route run ranks 10th among all wide receivers. Now, all those stats come from the Fantasy Points data suite. That's what I'm citing, and I have limited the sample to only wide receivers with at least 50 routes run, just so we don't have any kind of weird outlier players that have only run a handful of routes. Okay, but very, very good. Top 20 marks across the board in those stats. A couple of them are top 10. And he's at 14 points per game on the season, which makes him the wide receiver 23. That's already pretty good for where he's valued in Dynasty. But if you just look at the games with Joe Flacco this year, he would be at 17.4 points per game, which would make him the wide receiver 14 on the year. And I really like this chart that Fantasy Points tweeted out. It's their average separation score. And no, you're not going to get me to say the acronym. Charted against first read target percentage. I'll put a little circle around Josh Downs so you can see him. But he's in that upper right quadrant where he has very, very good separation and his quarterback loves throwing to him. And I just really like to see where he's at on these charts next to guys like Devonta Smith, Rashi Rice, Jamar Chase, Chris Godwin, right? He's in very good company when it comes to separation and getting targeted. And one thing that I think has suppressed his value as he's going through this breakout is the looming threat of Anthony Richardson, who does kind of kill the passing game whenever he's in there. But here's the thing, okay? The Colts have given up on Anthony Richardson. And I, I don't agree with their reasoning at all. I don't think they did the right thing. But they have chosen to play Joe Flacco. They have said they're going to play Joe Flacco the rest of the season. And I don't know if that'll really happen if they lose a bunch of games. He didn't look good last week. But even if Flacco gets benched and Richardson does come back some point this season out of necessity, he's still not their quarterback of the future. They have tipped their hand. They have shown us that they're not willing to give Richardson the time that he needs to develop into a legitimate passer. And so I'm confident that he is not their quarterback of the future. This, that's just not how these things play out. You look historically at other quarterbacks that have been in this type of situation, losing their job like this. It's, it's not likely that Richardson is going to be the starter in 2025 for the Colts. So as far as Josh Downs is concerned, 
he is freed from that situation. I'm really not worried about the long-term quarterback situation for Josh Downs because Joe Flacco is not very good at all. And he is accurate enough to make Josh Downs into a very relevant fantasy wide receiver. So I'm buying into the talent here. And I think people are anchored to their previous perception of him that he's like going to play second fiddle to Michael Pittman and that he's more of like a part-time role player. That's not what he is. Okay, he is a 23-year-old wide receiver providing high-end wide receiver two production right now on elite peripheral metrics, elite target earning metrics that we only see from top wide receivers in this league. So I think he needs to be valued significantly higher. Fantasy Calc has him as their 82nd overall player right now and a wide receiver 33. And remember, that ranking is a composite of thousands of completed trades. So he is being undervalued in a lot of trades right now. He's ranked alongside guys like DeAndre Swift, Xavier Worthy, Brian Robinson, Kirk Cousins, Michael Penix, Travis Kelsey. I traded for him a couple days ago for Deontay Johnson and a second. So he just needs to be ranked way, way higher. I have him in my dynasty rankings uh, as the wide receiver 22 and the 47th overall player in dynasty. I have him in the same tier as T Higgins, DK Metcalf, and Roma Dunze. I think he's that good for what it's worth. He also charted incredibly well in Matt Harmon's reception perception as a rookie, even against like press man coverage. So I think Downs can pretty much do it all. I think he's the clear number one wide receiver for the Colts now. And I think that they're moving away from Richardson, which while bad for their franchise is going to be good for Josh Downs. All right, next, I want to talk about another year two player, Chase Brown, running back for the Bengals. He has had an interesting journey to this point in the season. He was reported as the team's starter in August. The beat reporters were saying he was taking all the first team reps. And then he comes out in week one and is very clearly behind Zach Moss. He had just 19% of the running back rush attempts in week one, 35% of the routes, but he's steadily increased his share of the rush attempts throughout the season, as you can see here, um, starting out in the 18 to 19% range, working his way up to like 35, 48, 52%. And then in the last four games, 50%, 60%, 60%, and then 87% in week nine. So he has become the starter. Zach Moss is now out for the year. And the Bengals traded for Khalil Herbert, traded a seventh round pick for Khalil Herbert. That doesn't really worry me very much. I mean, I, I do not think that Chase Brown's going to get 27 carries every week. But I do think he's still going to get the lion's share of the work. And I don't think Khalil Herbert is that much of a threat for high-value touches. He was already seeding that stuff to Roshan Johnson in Chicago. I think Herbert's going to operate more in a change of pace role, getting a lot of carries between the 20s. But I still think Chase Brown is going to have a pretty good handle on this backfield. I think he's going to be getting the long down and distance. He's going to get the goal line stuff. He's going to get a significant portion of the routes. And in this offensive environment, with the amount of expected fantasy points to go around, you know, the, the number of red zone trips this offense is going to have. I think Brown is kind of a high end RB two, potentially even low end RB one the rest of the season. And for a guy that's just 24 years old, two more years left on his rookie deal playing with Joe Burrow. That's a player I want to be pretty aggressive about. And, and so I would pretty easily pay an early second for that type of player, you know, as a contender that you can, you can plug him into your lineup the rest of the season and you potentially have a multi-year starter in this type of a role. That is very appealing to me. And then another running back I would value pretty similarly is Tyrone Tracy rookie for the Giants. They drafted him in round four this year out of Iowa. Kind of an interesting player. Started out as a wide receiver in college. He only played one year as a running back. Manages to get that day three draft capital. It wasn't clear, you know, if he was maybe going to be a special teams player, how involved he was going to be. He, he kicks Eric Gray to the curb immediately and takes over the RB2 job. But he's a super duper old prospect. I mean, like he's literally, he's going to turn 25 within a few weeks a 25 year old rookie running back. That's the only reason you kind of have to pump the brakes on him a little bit and, and you can't rank him even higher. But the great thing about Tyrone Tracy is that people aren't totally wise to what he's been doing recently because I think there is some anchoring bias about him being a day three running back where we have these assumptions about these players that they're, you know, they're kind of spot starts only. They're, they're really only temporarily filling a role. So even when they're productive, people are very hesitant to, to give away something of value for these day three running backs and partially for good reason because we've been burned in the past. But Tracy's actually been playing very well. And I think the key is that he took over for Devin Singletary while Singletary was hurt. But Devin Singletary has been back for multiple weeks now off of the injury report. 
He's totally healthy, and they've just decided to continue to ride Tyrone Tracy as the main guy. So if you take a look here at his opportunities, this comes from the, the bell cow report within the data suite. You can see starting in week five, he took over 59% of the snaps, and then 83%, 67%, 60%, 71% of the snaps. So he's had very consistent high snap counts. He's had over 50% of the Giants rush attempts in four of those five games. I believe the one game that he didn't was actually because Daniel Jones had a ton of rush attempts in that game. He's been running a decent number of the routes. He's had a couple of games with a double digit target share. So he's just kind of doing a little bit of everything, but he's been generating a ton of explosive runs. He's had a couple of hundred yard games already. So this guy is just the starter for the Giants. They have decided that they're not going to play Devin Singletary and they're going to play Tracy. And that's pretty significant to me when you just think about what Devin Singletary's done, you know, kind of every stop throughout his career as this reliable running back. He's he's sort of kept other guys on the bench. And Brian Dable knows better than anybody what Devin Singletary can do. They were together in Buffalo. He went out of his way to bring him to New York. And yet he's so quick to put him on the bench for this round four rookie. So I see that as a very positive sign for Tracy and I'm ranking him pretty aggressively in Dynasty. I think he should be right up there with guys like Josh Jacobs, like Ramondre Stevenson, like Isaiah Pacheco. I don't mind if you want to put him, you know, a little bit, a little half step below those guys just because they've done it for longer. They have a little bit more pedigree, but I think he should be ahead of older running backs or less exciting running backs like Tony Pollard, Brian Robinson, Aaron Jones, those type of guys. I think the talent is there. I think the role is there. And I think based on how quickly he gained the, the trust of this staff, I think it could be a, a multi-year gig for Tracy. All right, I can't make a video about exciting young players and not get to my guy, Drake May. You had to know it was coming. I'm sorry, I'm sure I've talked about him enough, but we've had some new information since the last time I talked about Drake May on this channel. And here's the thing about what Drake May is doing, because people are catching on, like he's moving up but they are not catching on quickly enough. May is off to an incredibly hot start in his NFL career. In his three completed games, he has fantasy point totals of 22.5, 20.8, and 18.7. And you know why that is? Because Drake May has the Konami code, okay? He runs the ball. He has, according to Ron Stewart, the sixth most rushing yards for a quarterback in his first four starts since the year 2000. So he's behind Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, Robert Griffin, Jaden Daniels, and Tim Tebow in terms of rushing yards over their first four starts. So that's pretty amazing. And we also have this tweet from Jacob Gibbs. Drake May ranks second in scramble rate among all quarterbacks, first in avoided tackles per rush, first in first downs per rush, and first in yards per rush. So he has a tendency to scramble. That's the thing about quarterbacks that I think gets missed is that scrambling is not just an ability thing. It's a tendency thing. He has the tendency to scramble more so than other quarterbacks quarterbacks that have similar athletic profiles. Like Justin Herbert looks just like Josh Allen on paper. If you compare their size, their speed, their athletic testing, Justin Herbert could run like Josh Allen if he wanted to. It is not his tendency. Drake May has that same type of tendency as Allen where he is just prone to take off. So that's great, but he's also very good at it as evidenced by the first downs, as evidenced by the avoided tackles. So that is a huge asset for him in fantasy football. I mean, it's it's not a secret anymore that the quarterbacks that run a lot score a lot of fantasy points. And that has me very, very excited for Drake May. And I guess my real hot take here, the, the, the reason that I think people are just way too low is I don't understand why there should be a gap between Caleb Williams and Drake May and Dynasty. In fact, I personally moved Drake May ahead of Caleb Williams in my most recent Dynasty Rankings update. And before you go ahead and click off to another video, let me just lay this case out. If we look at Caleb Williams so far, 17 game pace of 3,500 passing yards, 19 touchdowns, 11 picks. Okay, sure, whatever. He's a rookie. He's in a, a pretty poorly designed offensive system. Right, but you look at Drake May's 17 game pace based on his three healthy starts that he played start to finish. 4,100 passing yards, 34 passing touchdowns, 11 interceptions. He's also working with a poor offensive line, 
He has no weapons to speak of, certainly worse weapons than Caleb Williams. And just based on my eye test right now, I don't think Caleb is like clearly the better passer. I don't think he's like leaps and bounds ahead of Drake May as a passer, but due to this high scramble rate, due to how often May takes off and runs and racks up fantasy points on the ground, he does not have to hit as high of a threshold as a passer to be a true fantasy star. Whereas for Caleb Williams, he has to go the more traditional route. He definitely does scramble a bit, but he has to go more on the Jordan Love, Joe Burrow type of route where he has to be one of the most efficient passers in the league if he's truly gonna hit like a top five ceiling. So this is not an anti Caleb Williams take. I think he's ultimately gonna be fine. They gotta fire Shane Waldron. They gotta get Keenan Allen off the field. But I, I do think Caleb Williams will be fine. I've seen him flash his, his ability in a couple of games this year where I'm like, okay, this guy has it. He's gonna figure it out. But this is just a pro Drake May take. I think he has right now the better chance to become kind of that perennial top five fantasy quarterback option. So I have moved him up to my 13th overall player in Superflex, and that is a humongous difference from where he is ranked on Fantasy Calc at 35 overall. He On Fantasy Calc, he's still behind Baker Mayfield. He's still behind Jonathan Taylor. I don't know what that's all about. I'm sure he'll continue to move up, but it's just not fast enough, okay? Give me Drake May over Caleb Williams. Give me Drake May over Kyler Murray, and give me Drake May over Amon Ross St. Brown. All right, we're going to close this out today with a true conundrum at wide receiver, another year two player named Cedric Tillman. And he is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. He has been the wide receiver one over the past three weeks, and he has consistently delivered in each week. This isn't a one-off Jawan Jennings performance. This is three consecutive games of Cedric Tillman just being absolutely dominant. This tweet from Ian Hardis lays it out pretty well. He ranks first in PPR points for the last three weeks, tied for first in targets. He is second in air yards. He is fifth in receiving yards, and he has three receiving touchdowns, which is tied for second. So there are players like Travis Fulgham who come out of nowhere and they perform a little bit and then they disappear. But at a certain point, you just cannot continue to ignore what Tillman is doing. And I think there was tons of reasons to be skeptical initially. His college production was not incredible by any means. He was an all right prospect. He was a, an older breakout age 21 breakout. He was a late declare. He was a third round pick in the NFL draft, uh, but he had like decent peak production in college. So he was actually pretty similar to Tank Dell as a prospect in terms of the, the age he broke out, how he broke out, where he got drafted. It's just that they're literally opposite body types, but otherwise very similar. But then the rookie season for Cedric Tillman was just like what I thought was irredeemably bad. He had just 13% targets per outrun and 0.68 yards per outrun, which is like a, a number so bad that you just don't come back. I mean, truly like bottom of the NFL type of stuff on a per out basis. And at that point, like I thought he was just kind of droppable in dynasty, whatever we see third round wide receivers that don't pan out all the time, especially ones that the Browns draft. Hello, Anthony Schwartz. Hello, David Bell. Uh, I, I just did not think anything of it, but now he's having kind of this Nico Collins-esque emergence and Nico was certainly better in his first two years than Tillman was as a rookie his peripheral numbers were actually not that bad he just played with Davis Mills but with Tillman at a certain point we just have to accept that he is doing this week in and week out you you can't take it away from him because nothing about his production is fraudulent in any way, at least not that I've found. He, he's not building this off of manufactured touches. His first read target percentage is high. They are, they are catering the offense to him and what he does well. His first downs per out run is very solid. So I've moved him into the top 100 of my dynasty rankings. I just think the upside here is clearly very high and I don't wanna miss the boat. So I'm willing to rank him aggressively, rank him potentially too high and trade players that I think don't quite have the same level of upside to, to chase what Cedric Tillman could potentially be. But Fantasy Calc is lagging way behind at 131st overall. They've still got him behind Cortland Sutton, Nick Chubb, Cole Kmet, Aaron Rodgers, Trey Benson. I mean, I, I'm trading a lot of those players that are ahead of him without hesitation. So I think this is a chance to get in on what could potentially be like a very exciting, very fantasy relevant player for a pretty low cost of entry, a pretty low risk investment at this point. And, and that's something that I'm definitely interested in doing. Anyway, that's gonna do it for today, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing to the channel. That goes a really long way, helps me to keep making these videos each and every week. I'll be back soon with another Dynasty video, and I hope I'll see you then.